Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to, uh, to come to this meeting. Um, and what I try to do in, is, in a couple of slides, just uh, summarize the sorts of thoughts that I had as I listened to um, uh, the discussion over the last, last day. Um, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in doing that, I tried to put it in the context of kind of reflections on what I had observed, at least in terms of previous experience um, uh, with GWAS uh, in, in complex diseases. And um, uh, there are these different kind of pulls uh, in, in different directions between the many smaller studies versus a few uh, <clears throat> larger experiments, and um, I think that one of the lessons from, from GWAS, as I, I think I mentioned earlier, was that, um, and as people are, are reflecting, that, that probably we need to be moving towards few larger uh, experiments, um, as was illustrated by the, the, the need for the meta-analysis of the smaller studies of, of GWAS. So I think there's very clear agreement on that. Um, um, there's been a lot of discussion in, in the past around the kind of deep versus, no one's used the word shallow, but I assume that's the opposite of deep, um, uh, um, uh, participant um, phenotyping. Um, and, and yet, as I, again, as I mentioned during the last day, uh, there was all of this focus um, in many of the different um, uh, GWAS and indeed family-based studies, some of which I was involved in, where we spent days, weeks, months arguing about what was the definition of the disease, um, what were the kind of characteristics we were going to record in the participants. And then um, we've seen with the meta-analysis of all sorts of different kinds of, of studies in GWAS that um, that, that has been largely ignored um, or found not to be uh, particularly important in terms of identifying um, variants that were uh, associated with disease. So um, uh, I think that it does argue for, perhaps not shallow, but um, uh, for these large cohorts that not having very intensive um, phenotyping does make sense as a, as a strategy. Um, the, the, the point that perhaps I hadn't heard brought out during the discussion, um, and which, which goes to the title of the meeting, uh, which is the difference between cohort studies and large sample collections, is the, the, the disadvantages or advantages of the different approaches. And um, you know, we look at the GWAS studies, they have tended to be uh, focusing on a disease and finding variants associated with a particular disease. Um, whereas a prospective cohort uh, doesn't focus on disease, on a particular disease, it allows us to look at the associations of risk factors with lots of different diseases. And so if we have a few large experiments, a few large cohorts um, with relatively shallow phenotyping, um, then we're able to, to within that, those, those few studies, study the, the uh, genetic and other determinants of many different uh, diseases. And um, so the longer it goes on, the more valuable it becomes, the, greater, the, the, the more return we get uh, for, for that investment, um, provided that we can uh, link those cohorts uh, with um, health records, and ideally, with uh, extensive um, uh, health records. Again, um, if we talk about cohorts, one of the big failings of prospective cohorts is that they tend not only not, if they're big, to phenotype the participants, but even more so, they tend not to identify or indeed phenotype uh, the diseases terribly well, and that's a criticism that's often made about prospective cohorts, that if they involve linkage, then they link to you know, death records or to cancer records, um, uh, but, but uh, information is not obtained about those uh, uh, diagnoses. Uh, and so I think that there is a question about how deeply uh, to phenotype uh, the disease. And, um, that we probably need to do a bit more in terms of phenotyping of the disease in these cohorts than has been done typically 
uh, in the past. And, and that may be another example of uh, identifying uh, people with disease and then going to uh, those records and getting more exquisite phenotyping of the diseases. So it's about the disease rather than the participants. Um, and again, I think if you look at the GWAS experience, what we've seen is that um, it's become international um, and that, that probably if we're thinking ahead, um, that we, we should, instead of um, having got to this point retrospectively uh, with GWAS, that we ought to be planning now for it to be international, not just have it occur through uh, necessity after 10 years of, uh, of studies that haven't produced results and being kind of forced to work together, that maybe uh, this is the time, uh, along, as with the Neanderthals, to share our DNA. Um, and um, y y in, in that respect, I also think that it's important um, to not have a short-term agenda driving the strategy. Um, and I think Peter Donnelly raised this point about, you know, if we do XM sequencing, in a few years' time, we'll wish we hadn't done it, we, we, because we'll throw away the data and, and have whole genome sequencing. So maybe we should be thinking not, what do I want in three years' time, but what in 10 to 15 years' time will I wish I had done? Um, and I think if we turn it around that way uh, and think about, well, what should we do in the next few years that we will have wanted to have done in 10 to 15 years' time? And that may be much more about bioinformatics and analysis of data than it is about actually understanding um, the genetics of disease. That maybe we should be not allowing the constraints of the cost to, to drive the next few years, but think about it as an opportunity to do relatively small-scale studies where we learn how to use the data, how to make sense of the data, so that when we can do it on the right scale, um, we, we then do it on the right scale and we know how to, to analyze those data rather than wait until um, we've got the data before working out how to analyze it. Um, and I, I just wanted to, to touch on, on this thing about disease adjudication, because um, I think the sorts of things that we see with eMERGE and other kinds of um, uh, settings where we can, we can put cohorts or establish cohorts or have cohorts within a health record linkage system uh, really does allow us over the long term to, to, to uh, build a resource that will really, really uh, allow us to get uh, enormous information about the genetics and other determinants of disease. So I think that if we're going to have a, some large-scale studies, we need to have very scalable approaches to identifying uh, disease. And I think the other important thing is we need scalable approaches that can identify a lot of different kinds of disease. So rather than having the focus be on diseases that are well studied because we're able to find them, like death and cancer, we want to be in a situation where, as with Emerge and these other studies, you can link to other kinds of information, hospital discharge records, primary care records, um, uh, where we can perhaps use new technology to find out about uh, health outcomes uh, easily on a large scale that are not picked up from record systems. So you, can we use email to uh, assess people? Uh, can we use email to assess their cognitive function and cognitive decline over time? Uh, or can we use it to detect other things that are not detected well by primary care or, or, or hospital? depression, uh, musculoskeletal problems, the kinds of things that, that perhaps haven't been studied well in these kinds of studies. And then to use those crude systems um, to identify cases and then use more 
specialized record system, so I'm still not talking about going back to the participants all the time, but using other kinds of more detailed record systems um, uh, to find out more about the individual. So there might be particular uh, registers of cancer or of um, morbidity in Britain, for example, myocardial infarction. Um, can we cross-reference different electronic record systems to adjudicate um, or confirm uh, the, the, that a person has a particular disease. Could we send out kits where people would have a blood sample taken and that would help us to confirm uh, the disease? And then go even further uh, to, to build up um, a resource in terms of the phenotyping of the disease. Um, a, I think uh, uh, Julie described what's been done in the, the, uh, the health professional study or nurses study around getting tumor collections where people have been diagnosed with cancer so that the cancer itself could be um, analyzed. Um, uh, can we get imaging data about particular types of outcomes, say stroke, um, in order to determine what kind of stroke and to subclassify it in more detail? And you know, I just... You, it would be remiss of me as the PI of Biobank not to describe it, but you know, it has a number of these characteristics. That's not to say there aren't other uh, cohorts like that in the US, there clearly are. Um, but I think that it does reflect the kinds of things that have been talked about today and yesterday around having large prospective cohorts, um, the ability to look at uh, a particular exposure on a range of different diseases, or many different kinds of exposure and how they interact with each other, to have sufficiently detailed information about uh, a large number of people, and then the potential to enhance the phenotyping in large subsets, for example, the proposal that we have to image in 100,000. Um, and again, going to the points that were made around uh, access, uh, the ability for researchers from anywhere in the world to access the resource, um, to use it for any kind of health-related research, uh, to have the ability for recontact. I think these are all the kinds of things that we need to be building into a few, at least a few large cohorts or that may already exist within cohorts in other parts of the world and in the US so that um, uh, internationally we have the potential to, to do these large sequencing studies. So. Um, those were the kind of thoughts I had as I listened to the discussion. It kind of feels as if um, we should perhaps not do too much over the next few years uh, and just um, wait, and, you know, wait a little bit uh, um, uh, before we you know, spend huge amounts of money on sequencing, just wait until the, the cost comes down. Um, I, I, I think there's a danger of going too fast, actually. So I, I would strongly endorse the idea that uh, you know, we need to think of this as a, a project that's going to go on for uh, generations, but uh, 10 or 15 years is a good time scale. It's roughly the one that we chose for the HGP. Uh, what do we want to have accomplished at the end of it? On, on the issue of going too fast, uh, that is a risk. Uh, the HGP approach was really borrowed very directly from Fred Sanger. If you look at the history of Sanger's uh, immense contributions to uh, DNA sequencing, uh, he tackled projects which, which scaled up by about a factor of three, uh, and projects where he could bring the, so a, a key phrase in the Alberts Committee report about the Human Genome Project was, was pilot projects of increasing scope and scale. And I think that's exactly what we need here. We just want those projects to have the characteristics that they really are building, you know, toward this different discovery model, as I've called it. Yeah, I think that was the point I was trying to make, that we designed the strategy for the next few years based on what we want to have done in 10 to 15 years, rather than having a kind of interim strategy that doesn't build towards that. Yeah, I mean, to that end, uh, I fully agree that we need to have pilots and 
we learn as we go along. If we just take your analogy of the GWAS, you know, we started with 500 or 1,000 cases, and, you know, people said, well, let's wait until the chips are cheaper. And people just kept pushing along, and I think we learned a tremendous amount, such at the point that when the chips got very cheap and we had enough people scanned, we had worked out an awful lot about the meta-analyses and imputations, so the discovery was was continuing with the addition of these new technologies. So um, I have a little bit of a different view. I think we should design very good pilots but go as fast as we can, knowing that we're going to revisit these things and that for the numbers that we've talked about, we're going to have to get very large. And I think whatever pilot we come up with is going to be inadequately powered to adequately address many of the things that have been discussed around this table today. And, you know, it's going to be in the McDonald's supersizing of this that may not be just this project, but things going on in the Netherlands and Estonia and Spain, England, you know, China, lots of other projects that uh, will hopefully have what I think you pointed out so very nicely, that the international collaborative spirit. I mean, this, this group isn't going to do it all by itself. And, you know, it, you know, I would like to just emphasize the value of doing as much in those pilots as we practically can, knowing that we'll make some mistakes and we'll just get better as we iteratively go through the data. I guess what I was trying to say was that having learned from GWAS, it might be an idea to work together prospectively rather than work together retrospectively. And that, that one could avoid a lot of unnecessary replication um, by, by doing so. That was really the point. But I think we're at that point. I mean, that's the beauty of GWAS. It's set that standard. I think many of the people around this table and who are part of the studies that touch the people here have been in meta-analyses, and it's not an uncommon thing. You know, and there, there are many primary data sets that are showing up for the first time as part of meta-analysis as opposed to the old sort of 14th century, I need to put my flag in the ground and have my paper that shows that my study is, is out there. Uh, you know, we, we've seen that sociologic transition already begin. That wasn't the 14th century, that was about 2009. No, I know. <laughs> well, but if you, take, if you take genetics since the, the, the year 0 AD, it, that would probably correlate to a nigh creepier. The only comment I'll add is, in some ways, you know, ESP charge the type 2 diabetes consortium. We have many things that going on that could be considered pilots that could be, we can learn on from today. And I'm sure in the cancer area, there's many things going on. Paul? Uh, yeah, Paul Sorley, uh, epidemiology branch, uh, NHLBI. Uh, just to step back a little bit, I think, since this is a wrap-up, there's an awful lot of people out there and maybe in this room who think that all the money that's gone into genetics has essentially gone into a hole without a bottom, probably, um, and that in the larger scheme of things for public health, the, um, the advances from genetics have been really very, very small. If you're going to put lots of money into another technology and they will say, another technology that's really cool, um, I think you're going to have to do a lot to convince people that you really are going to do something big here. Two statements that were made and they were sort of reiterated here. One was in terms earlier in terms of goals. They need to be big goals. I think that was the word. They've got to be substantial to say to people that you can address the causes and prevention of disease. And the second is related to the pilot. You've got to convince people that in fact this is feasible, that it's more than just a new technology, but you can really make some advances in this. Otherwise, I think it's gonna be pretty hard to convince uh, some people to put a whole bunch more money into this. Public health, yeah, exactly, yeah. I mean, I, I, I agree with you, but I think we have to also take stock of just putting the genetics and genomics in the context of discovery. If we think of other things, the history of cardiovascular surgery or the history of cancer uh, you know, therapies, many of these things date back to, you know, 40, 50 years ago when they were 10, 15, 20 years of very difficult pilot studies. NIH has a whole blue building that was built for doing cardiovascular surgery and the number of difficulties and, and things that they learn were the basis from which then cardiovascular surgery really took off in the same way with cancer therapy. So I, 
you know, I, I, we have to be very careful, but we also have a, his, a history that we see behind us. And from that, we, I think we have to argue on the basis of having very important goals, but knowing that this is a long-term project and that we don't get the quick fixes. And that's where the GWAS age really did us in with people declaring that, you know, we would be able to have these tests and explain their, you know, the heritability of all of these complex diseases in a matter of two or three years. In a sense, we did ourselves in on that. And in thinking about this next pilot, or this next set of projects, we have to be a little more realistic in that larger context. I just want to make a comment about Maynard's statement about IT, which I guess I'll exaggerate a little about don't freak out, and citing credit card systems, bank systems, streaming as evidence that big problems can be solved. And I'll just make the point that the people who did that or the... the um, powers behind it invested huge amounts of money and that in biomedical research we tend to be very chary with the amount of money we want to spend on information systems and that's something that we need to uh, to really change Chris just um, to follow up on on Paul's comment um, and also a little on Rory's um, kind of triangular caseness you know being important Definitely agree that um, if we're going to be ambitious, we, we're going to need to make some, to set some really tight priorities. And, and one way to think about this is diseases. You know, specific, rather than having a thousand flowers, maybe a couple of diseases, um, within which there could be, if, if, you, if you have control population, like a case cohort, you could be looking at a number of other things within that control population. So that's just one thing to consider. And then the other is, in terms of, I think we need to push both the pheno phenotypers and the gene and the sequencers. You know, we've heard this um, yesterday, I guess, that um, I, think it, I think it was $10 million for 2,000 whole genomes. But the, but the cost um, issue there is the, is the coverage. So if you, have lower, if you have lower fold coverage, you could potentially sequence many more people. But we didn't have any, we didn't hear any discussion about that. Um, similarly, I brought up the comment about the, about the exome chip and the metabo chip, et cetera. Maybe that's a way to make the dollar go a little further in terms of much larger cohorts. So these are the kinds of things I think. And then on the phenotyping side, it's, it's, the, it's the resolution of the phenotype. Maybe the UK Biobank, you could, before you get into the sequencing, select 5,000, 10,000 of case X and do that detailed phenotyping and say, these are bona fide cases. They're not just kind of like um, hospital discharge diagnoses or similarly in eMERGE. So it seems like on both sides, and this is going to require cooperation, no, no doubt, both within the U.S. And, and internationally. Rory, I wanted to make this or have the same question as I asked Dan earlier. One of the things I'm concerned about if we, we require, we link this too closely to this word unelectronic medical record. In this country, we don't have an, you know, we don't have a national health service. We don't have an electronic medical record. And I want to make sure that in designing a study moving forward, that we don't wrap it too closely around an electronic medical record, which would exclude a, a huge proportion of this population that's already underserved, and this would just go, go further to make them more underserved. Well, I mean, I absolutely agree with you about <clears throat> the value of heterogeneity, um, but you don't necessarily have to have all of the heterogeneity in all of the studies. I mean, you can have, if you have a few major studies, then uh, you, you, want you, you want to have a few studies, ideally in different populations, that increase your heterogeneity. You know, if you want to study um, Asians, go to Asia. Don't take them as a minority group in, in the US. Uh, so I agree, you want heterogeneity, and you can do that between, by having studies in different populations. Um, and I think that's true of socioeconomic uh, aspects which you raise, um, where you can get uh, socioeconomic diversity within a cohort, then get it there. There may be other kinds of diversity that you can get in a study in the US, but you don't have to have everything everywhere. Yeah, maybe I could, I could also comment on, on the, the fact that sadly in the US, people who don't have access to medical care or medical insurance or electronic medical records are, are not that 
unusual. Um, in, in other countries, they're really strange people. Um, in, in this country, they're not. Um, so, so we're probably capturing a lot of the characteristics of those folks by getting a, a broad range of, of people in the U.S., even including some of those who do have access to medical care. Okay. Um, I was just thinking, you know, I think we did a great job at the end of talking about our criteria for selecting samples, but I was trying to tie this together with our first slide today, which was on sort of the scientific questions addressable by sequencing. And I was wondering if we ever talked about the order, meaning that were we, were we thinking we would pick sort of a couple that were just the the ones to go with, and then while you're putting together the samples to sequence, it's sort of making sure that they will cover what's needed to be able to do it? Or is it putting together a resource, and then of all the wonderful things that could be done with it, we'll pick afterward? And it makes a difference just sort of logistically. Because if, for example, we decide no matter what we do, we better make sure that diversity, by ethnic group, we really ought to be able to make comparisons, then the way that you put together this sample will be very different than if we just put one together that represents everybody and then we play with it. Um, and I, I'm not I could, sure we did that too much. I, I, I couldn't agree with you more, and I was actually thinking a few minutes ago but almost exactly that. I think actually that's going to be Terry and I's biggest challenge in putting the document together from this meeting is frankly, today, it's, it was hard to do everything in a single day. But I think you're absolutely right. We have to have these recommendations from the afternoon tie back to those use case scenarios or questions from the morning. That right now, they're not. And, but I think we can do that. Sorry. Go ahead, Nancy. Why? No, no, no. Maybe better. Okay. 